So, October 11th, this Friday, at 5 p.m., we're going to have a church-wide cornhole tournament hosted by the men's ministry. We're going to have food, a devotional, and obviously cornhole. So if you'd like to go, please let Danny know or Pastor Brian. While we're eating, we're going to pass out numbers, and that's how you're going to get your partner for the tournament. Also coming up this Sunday, the 13th at 6 o'clock in the Annex, is our women's ministry fall event. So we're going to have games, there'll be food, and there'll be devotional as well. So please bring your favorite fall finger food or appetizer to share with everybody. And then October 26th, we're going to have our trunk or treat. We're going to be having a chili cook-off, so we invite you to bring your best chili to enter into that. We're also going to be doing a contest for the best decorated trunk. So Please decorate your trunk so we can give out candy to the little kids. And we also ask that there is nothing scary, so then don't scare the little ones. Uh, Sunday evening prayer time will be this evening at 5 o'clock at the church. So as we go into a time of tithing, um, I'm going to read a verse from Luke 16, and it says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So much, however much or little wealth we have, our handling it is a measure of our faithfulness and a preparation for our future responsibilities. We are to be careful. Wealth is a poor master, but we can see that God uses it as a servant. There are multiple ways that you can give this morning. You can mail it into 130 Depot Street, or there's a drop box in the back, as well as downstairs, or you can give on Tidely. Now if you bow your head and close your eyes, we will, bow your, we will pray over the offering. Dear Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you that you have brought all of us here to learn more about you and to fellowship with one another. God, we just pray over this tithe and offering that you would be able to take what we're able to give to you and you would be able to turn it into something amazing and all for the glory of your kingdom. And we should again we pray. Amen.
Thank you.
mighty God, we thank you that we are able to be in your presence today. God, some people have some things come against them this morning even to make it into the house. But I'm so glad that you were not able to, they were able to be here, God, and that we're just going to give you praise and give you glory and give you honor for who you are. God, that you would just be in this place, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, God, you would touch our minds, that we would know that we are here to worship you. Right in our lives. 
And so um, as followers of Christ, sometimes a transitional period can be difficult, right? We like we don't like the transition times. I don't do it. I, I like to be in a place. I like to know a plan. I like to have a plan, all the things. So sometimes the in-between can be hard, right? And so, and also as followers of Christ, sometimes the daunting question that everyone wants to know is what is my call, right? What am I to do for the kingdom of God? Because once you become saved and you follow Christ, it just seems like the next logical question, right? The next logical question, what am I supposed to do, God? What would you have me do? How am I supposed to glorify your kingdom, right? And I've asked this question time and time again about my own life, and I know others have asked the same question. And sometimes when you're wanting to do more, or sometimes if you're a new uh, follower of Christ, or a new Christian, or newly saved, or if you've been saved and you're in a transitional period, or or maybe you've had some sort of trauma and you've taken a break, or whatever it, whatever it might be, you're in this time and you begin to say to God, okay God, what is next, right? Show me what I'm called to do next for you, right? And so, um, because it's really scary, when you want to serve and you want to be in his will, but you're not sure what that looks like. And so like I said, I'm a planner and I want to know what the next thing is always. I don't like to not have a plan. I don't like to not know what's next um, I, in all things in my life. I mean, I'm talking about my calendar of school, which is for things and reminders because I don't like surprises. I want everything to be so so right and so um and so these transitional times where i'm not doing this and i'm not doing this in this transitional period and i'm just sharing my heart with you can be difficult right it can be difficult because i'm like okay god what is next what would you have me do because see i'm a servant i like to serve and i get and i want to be in the will of god i want to know what is it that you would have me do next for your kingdom, right? And so God began to speak to my heart because this is kind of dwelling on me. Like, okay, God, I'm not the youth pastor anymore. We're, done, we're past the kids' ministry now. Like, I've not moved into another type of ministry, God. So what is next? So God began to speak to my heart and, and tell me about the call, right? And so the word says that Samuel was in the house of the Lord with Eli, and he was there where the ark of God was, which this represents that he was in the presence of God. He was in God's presence. So Samuel had placed himself in God's presence, and he was sleeping there, he was staying there, he was working there, and while he was in God's presence, God called out to him, Samuel, and God calls Samuel, and then he goes to Eli. And the word doesn't say that he just walked or he sauntered to Eli. He was uh, lying on his bed, and, and the Lord called, and he said, the word says that he ran. So he got up out of his uh, you know, bed, and he ran to Eli, and he said, you called me. You called me. What do you need? And Eli said, I, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Right? He probably wasn't very frustrated the first time. He was probably like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, go back to bed. And then, but then Samuel goes back to bed, and then the Lord calls Samuel, and he says, Samuel, and Samuel, he, he didn't say that he lollygagged or he said, oh, I better go see him once again. He said that he ran. He ran to Eli, and he said, you called me. Here I am. And so, uh, and then Eli says, I, I didn't call you, son. Go to bed. Get some rest. He's probably made a little annoyed at that point, right? So he's like, go. And so then Samuel goes back and, you know, I mean, Samuel's probably thinking, like, am I going crazy? Like, I know I heard my name. You know, I know, you know when you know you heard something and no one else can hear it? Like, you're like, this is it, right? And the other person's like, I don't hear it. So, so he's probably like, what's going on? So he goes back and he, and, he does, and he goes to his bed and then he hears it again. Samuel. So once again, for the third time, he runs to Eli. He says, I'm here. I'm here. He was anxious. He was anxious to, to, to get to him. And Eli said, I didn't call you. And then he realized. He said, Samuel, the Lord has called you. Go back. Go back to your bed. And this time, say, Lord, I'm listening. I'm listening. And so this time he goes.
goes back, he goes back after, you know, the third time, and he, he gets in his bed, and he hears, Samuel, Samuel, and he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So even though Samuel was in God's house, in his presence, he was confused about his call at first. He was doing the work. He was in the house. He was in God's presence. And he was still confused about the call. Because the word says he didn't know God's voice yet. See, he was running to the wrong place. He was running around and he was trying to answer the call, but he had it all wrong, right? He had the right passion. He got up and he was running to where he thought he was supposed to go, but he had the wrong person, right? He had the right passion, but the wrong person. And I think sometimes as Christians, we do this. We're doing God's work and, he, and God is calling us, but instead of just listening to him, we're running to all the other things that are familiar. We run to the things that we know. We run to the people that we know. We run to the situations that we know, right? See, he, he was running to Eli because he knew Eli, and he was working with Eli, so that's where he was running to. And so many times, instead of just listening to what God, to hear God's voice, we're running around trying to do it on our own. Right? We run to what's convenient. We run to what's right there. We, we do all the things. But Samuel needed to simply be still and listen. He was ready. He was in God's house. He was in his presence and he was listening. But his response was wrong at first. At first he was just running around trying to figure it out on his own. And we do this. We have talents and we use them the wrong way, or we don't use them at all. When we have gifts, and we don't use them for the kingdom, or we don't or we don't use them at all, right? And then the last time that he went back to bed and his response was different, he stayed, and when he said, speak, I'm listening, then God spoke to him. And when he sat in God's presence and listened, that's when God told him his call. He found his place when he wasn't, when he was in God's presence. He was working, he was resting, and he was listening. And when we are ready to say, Lord, speak to me. Not the run around me, I've got ten things to do over here, or the run around me, I've, I've done this for the church, I've done this for the church, I've done this. The real me. I mean, the broken me, the sinner me, the I need forgiveness me, the, the here I am, Lord, please speak to me, me. <laughs> That's when God will reveal himself the plan in the plan. When God first called Samuel, he was confused, and he didn't even know it was him because he didn't know his voice. And then God gave him a task, and he recognized his task, he was going to be a prophet, and he became recognized as a prophet. And if you read, you'll, you'll have to go and read it. But God told Samuel that he was going to have to reveal some um, not so great news to Eli. And Eli was like, man, I don't really, really want to do that. Like, I've been working with Eli, and I really don't want to tell him bad news. Like, who likes to give bad news, right? But God's like, oh, this is kind of what I've called you to do. And so he didn't really want to, but he did it anyway. And then the word says in 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 21, it says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And if you read on, until the next chapter, 1 Samuel 4, 1 says, And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. He was known so well to speak God's word that eventually in chapter 4, it said that Samuel's word, not God's word, was known to all of Israel. 
because he was so well known as a prophet for God that they just knew that what he spoke was of God. So Samuel went from running around and not even recognizing God's voice, not even recognizing um, who he who he was and, and what he was supposed to do, running around and going to Eli to be and re recognizing God's voice to being a favored prophet that when he spoke, everyone recognized that it was God's words. Because he was in his presence and he listened and he responded and he responded eventually like he should have. And all of you are probably sitting in your put in this seat today and you're probably like, you know what, Kelly, that's great. I'm so glad that Samuel listened and that he that God spoke to him in an audible voice and he found it out exactly what he's supposed to do. And, and I'm not diminishing the story. Like, it's amazing. Like, I mean, Samuel became a great prophet. But I don't know about you, and maybe you have. I have not. I have never heard an audible voice from God. Now, I've had God speak to my heart. I've had God lay things at my heart that I know was of God, right? But I have not ever heard an audible voice say, Kelly, do this. Or, Kelly, this is your call. So if you have, that, I mean, I, that's great. But I have not. So what I... What I really want to talk about today with the call is the release, right? Because I just want to take a little bit of a burden off your mind today. Because this is a burden that has been on my heart. So you are called for a specific pur pur purpose. And you are, uh, God has ordained you for a specific purpose for your life, right? But no matter what your specific call is, we are all called for such a time as this. Our primary calling is to glorify God. That is our calling. That is your call, right? 1 Peter 2, 9 says he called you out of darkness into the light. So you are called to be in the light, and God is the light. So you are called to be with him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to know him. That is your calling. That is your calling, right? And so when Samuel listened and he was obedient, he found him, uh, uh, he found him instead of him finding his calling. See, he was doing God's work and he continued to be in his presence and then God called him out, right? Your calling is to be faithful in the little things. Your calling is to put God first and put God in your path every single day. Your calling is to be receptive to God. Your calling is to be open to what God is doing in your life and around you. Your calling is to read the Bible regularly, to study and to pray and to know him. Your calling is to consider your roles. Think about the roles that you play in your life, such as uh, I'm, a, I'm a mother, I'm a, um, a spouse, I'm a wife, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a daughter, I'm an aunt, I'm a cousin, I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, I'm a leader, I'm a prayer, right? You're, we all have specific names, we all have specific things in our life. Those are your callings. Why do we continue? Why do we settle on just one? We all have many callings. I can't just pick to be a mother or a spouse or a teacher or a preacher, right? I get to be all of those things. I have many callings, as do you. You have many callings on your life. We are called for God to speak through us, right? And I'm not giving you an excuse to sit back and not do anything. I'm not giving you an out to not do what God wants you to do. Because if you are called to preach, then you need to preach. If you are called to be a worship leader, then you need to be a worship leader. If you are called to work in jails, then you need to work in jails. If you're called to work with the, the homeless, then you need to work with the homeless. If you are called to be a nurse, then you need to be a nurse. Because I'm telling you, you will not be able to do anything and feel fulfilled until you are in your calling, right? So I'm not diminishing those things. But what I'm telling you first and foremost is that you are called to be God's warrior. You are called to be his champion. You are called to be his instrument. You are called to be a reflection of love and light. And your calling is about who you are before what you do. Because he calls you to a who 
before he calls you to a do. Are you listening to me? He calls you to a who before he calls you to a do. You need to recognize who you are. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. You need to recognize. I recognize that I am a mother. I recognize that I am a wife. I recognize the significance and the importance of those roles in my life, right? And that's who I am. It's not about what I do all the time. First of all, I got to recognize who I am, right? Who I am in Christ. It's about who you are, about who before I do. Because sometimes in our flesh and because we're human, we have to have a title to think we can make a difference. We want, we want to be titled the pastor. We want, to, we want to be titled the leader. We want to be titled in this. We want to be titled in that because it just makes you feel more important, right? I remember one time we ran into this guy and uh, said, you know, it said, I'll just say Smith. It's not Smith. Or I'm just using an example. But he said, um, oh, you know, hey, Mr. Smith, how are you? And he looked at him in the most stern voice and he looked at him and said, it's not Mr. Smith. It's Dr. Smith. I said, oh, my He, he didn't know. He, he, wanted, he wanted that title. And sometimes we think titles are more important than what we're doing. And in the Bible story with the young boy, he was called to give his bread and fish, his lunch. One of the greatest miracles in the Bible and one of the most well-known stories, I mean, you teach it, you know, from the smallest of ages. He gave his fish and bread. He gave his lunch. And God, and Jesus multiplied, right? And it fed over 5,000 people. You know what the little boy's name was? It didn't name it. We don't know. He was called to give. He didn't have a title. He didn't have awards around his neck. Nobody jumped up and down and said, oh, yeah, a little boy. Right? But he was recognized. He was called as a giver. <coughs> the same thing with the friends, the four friends who carried their their uh, friend, right? For miles and miles, they, they carried their friend. And they said, we, we just got to get you to Jesus. We just need to get you to Jesus. We know that you'll be healed if we can just get you to Jesus. And so they carried their friend, the four men did. And then not only did they carry him there, then they couldn't get in. And so they climbed up and they lowered him down through the roof. They began to tear the roof off the house to get their friend to Jesus. And, and the, the man was, uh, Jesus touched him and he had a miracle and he walked away from that. But you want to know the name of the four men in the Bible that did that for their friend? He doesn't give it. They were called to take their friend to Jesus. We need to get away from the titles. We need to get away from what I'm so, what am I called to do? We are called to be light. You're called to be who you are in this moment, at this time. Right? A name and a title and position doesn't make us who we are. And my mom, I know I talk about my mom a lot, but she was, she was my lady, right? She was my girl. <laughs> she was my mentor and help in all things. And she was the most quiet person probably that I've ever known. And she never stood in a pulpit that I know of. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but she never did. She never preached a sermon on stage. I think she preached to us a couple of times. <laughs> she never preached a sermon. And she never fed 5,000 with fish and bread. Matter of fact, she didn't like to cook at all. Right? And she never physically carried a man to Jesus through her roof. But she was called. She was called to be a mother. She was called to be a grandmother. She was called to be a teacher, a wife, a daughter, a 
sister, a friend, a matriarch, a nurse, a therapist, a hugger. She was called many things and impacted more lives than she ever knew. And she knew those callings and she modeled it. She modeled how to be a follower of Christ. My dad never came to church until later on when we were pretty much grown. And so she was called to be a mother, but she was called to be a mother to teach her children about Christ. And it's a lot easier to get up in the mornings by yourself and get dressed and come to church. One person. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Lord, right? Amen. <laughs> yes, yes. But I'm telling you, we could all we could have stayed at home with my dad. No, sir. She got us all wrangled up. And back in the day, you didn't just come in jeans or whatever. I mean, you had to like dress up. Got us all dressed up and brought us to church. She modeled that you had to come that you needed to come to church. She modeled that you don't talk about people either. But when she was in sick, when she was sick and she was in hospice care for months and she'd come home, you know, I don't know, there are a couple of different times that she just said, I don't know, but I did enough. And, you know, my mom was sick for a long time, but those last six months of her life, so many people came in and they just told her story after story about how she impacted their lives because she was called a child of God. She was called a servant. So I don't want us to diminish our impact because of a title. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. We're called to a holy life. So a better question rather than what am I called to do is who am I called to become? Because who you are is more important than what you do. If I'm called to be a preacher and I'm not living a holy life, then it needs to be more about who I am, right? Who are you in Christ? But even though there is a release, so for me, when God spoke this word to me and said, Kelly, I have these callings. These are the callings on your life right now. And you may feel like you're in a transition period, but these are the callings I'm giving you right now. You are so much more than this. You are all these other things. These are your callings, right? And so even though that's a, oh, okay, God, I got you, right? <laughs> I know that I still have to be in his presence. I still have to be working towards the next call. And sometimes our call will require us to go through some stuff to be prepared. When I first felt like I was called to preach. I didn't even tell anybody. I didn't even tell Sad for the longest time. And because I was scared, right? And then when I finally told Pastor, he was like, okay, well, it's about time. You know, I've said that before, but I didn't come up here on a Sunday morning and preach for the very first time, right? I taught kids in Sunday school. I taught in Sunday school. I taught, I taught kids' church. Pastor had me do a series on a Wednesday night. We had Sunday evening church, right? All of these things, God was preparing me. He was getting me ready, right? He was getting me ready and in preparation. So sometimes we have to be getting prepared for our call. And sometimes that means that we're going to have to go through some things. We're going to learn some things. And we may have 
have to wait. And sometimes we might have to be pressed in order to be what God wants us to do and be. I don't know why. I, we, you know, we, my family, have experienced a, a lot of death in our family. Like, it's really unfortunate. Um, I mean, I, I've lost both sets of grandparents. You know, we lost my brother at the age of three, very young, unexpected. Lost my dad at a very early age. And we lost my mom. And it's just a lot, right? It's just like a lot. And God spoke to my heart years ago about that. You know, and I just said, Kelly, you need to be so grateful and thankful that you had some really great people in your life. And so anytime I think, God, I wish I could have been here a little bit longer, he's like, I blessed you with them. I blessed you with some amazing parents, with some amazing grandparents, with some amazing people in your life. So be thankful for the time you have. But I say that to say that because I've lost some really important people in my life, I have this, like, just hurt in my heart when someone loses someone close to them. And it's like the only hurt that you can have when you've lost somebody that you love so much. And so I just pray for them fervently. And someone uh, texted me over the weekend who's lost someone significant in their life and said, you're the only person I know that will understand how hard this is. And I was able to use that opportunity to minister and to witness to the glory of God. Because I've been there. Because they reached out to me because they know that I've experienced that hurt and God pressed he pressed. So, but you know what happens in the Bible when, when they're making uh, the lamp oil? See, they take olives and they take these baskets and they press them and they press them and they press them about three different times to make sure that they get everything out and then the, the oil flows from the, from the olive and then it comes down and it comes in this like pool or whatever. And you know what they did with that oil from the olives that had just been pressed and pressed and pressed. They use them in the lamps to be lights. They use them on the lamp stands in the where the Ark of the Covenant is, right? To glory, to know that the light is there. That you are in the presence of the Almighty God. And so I'm telling you, I don't know why, but I have been pressed before. I have been pressed. And like I said, most of the time when they go through that cycle, it's about three times. And so it's just a pressing and the oil comes out. And it's a pressing and the oil comes out. And it's a pressing and the oil comes out. And I'm like, God, I don't know if you have anything else. I don't know if you can get anything else out of me. But then when it all collects, it's a light. Amen. God, let me. God, please let me be light. Because if I have nothing else, if I have not any of those other titles, if I don't ever get to the specific purpose, whatever you call me, me to learn, Lord, let me be a light that the pressing would not go for naught. That I would be a light for you. That I would be a light for your kingdom. So we are called to be a light, which sometimes means that we have to be pressed. I don't know if you're in any type of situation right now. I don't know if you're battling anything. I don't know if God's preparing you right now for anything else. But I just keep thinking, what if the broken relationship that you're in right now is just getting you ready for your call, right? What if the illness that you're experiencing right now in this moment is getting you ready for a call? What if the loss that you have suffered in whatever capacity is just getting you ready for the call? What if the disappointment in your life is just preparing you for the call? What if the trauma is just preparing you for what's next? What if it's just enough oppressing so that you can be a light? But through it all, we have to remember that the who is more important than the do. 
God cares about who you are in Him. And when you're in His presence and you are working like Samuel was, he was in the temple, he was in the house of God, and he was in his presence, and then you sit and listen. God will call you out. But until then, you're called so many other things, so many other names. So maybe you're here today, and you need strength through the, just the pressing. Whatever the pressing is, whatever the battle, whatever the, the situation is, whatever the pressing is, or maybe you're just holding on to see what the call is. Maybe you're in this transitional period and you're like, God, I, I need to know because I've been asking, God, what's next? Or maybe you just want to know God more. Maybe you just wanted to come closer to him. Whatever it is, 